Good afternoon, attendees of this colloquium. I'm Abigail Payne, the Ronald Henderson Professor and Director of the Melbourne Institute Applied Economics and Social Research in the Faculty of Business Economics. Let me extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you. Let me also acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Today marks a special day. While I always look forward to our colloquia, today we are launching the first of our Breaking Down Barriers report series in collaboration with the Paul Ramsey Foundation. This new series is intended to address the need in Australia for more and deeper analyses of poverty and disadvantage more generally. It will help us to better understand the challenges faced by individuals, families, communities, and governments in addressing this important topic and to promote and enable program development and policy innovation. In recognition of this new report series, I would like to invite a few others to provide a few words. First up is Professor Paul Kaufman, Dean of the Faculty of Business Economics. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Abigail, and good afternoon. I am Paul Kaufman, Sydney Meyer Chair of Commerce and Dean of the Faculty of Business and Economics. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, traditional owners of the land on which today's Melbourne Institute virtual colloquium takes place. A warm welcome to you all. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Paul Ramsey Foundation for their generous philanthropic support for this project and their support of health and other initiatives at the University of Melbourne. I am delighted to be part of the launch of the new Melbourne Institute Breaking Down Barriers report series. This series has been established as part of a collaboration with the Paul Ramsey Foundation. It demonstrates the importance of creating partnerships with a focus on informing and shaping Australian economic and social policy and practice. The Breaking Down Barriers report series is focused on addressing persistent and entrenched disadvantage. Breaking Down Barriers represents the next step in a long-standing history of research and analysis undertaken by the Melbourne Institute on disadvantage, income inequality, and poverty more generally. The Institute has a 58 year history that included the establishment of the Henderson Poverty Line, work on tax and transfer policy, work on understanding consumer sentiment and expectations for the economy, the development of the Journeys Home and Hilda data sets, and a host of other activities focused on macro and microeconomic policy issues. In concluding, I would be remiss if I did not mention the importance of partnerships, such as the one being forged with the Paul Ramsey Foundation during this time of crisis we face with the pandemic. Undoubtedly, poverty and disadvantage will get worse as we work our way through the economic crisis we are currently facing. Thus, understanding and addressing disadvantage is even more critical today. Back to you, Abigail. Great, thank you, Paul. Next, I would like to welcome Dr. Jenny Whalen, Chief Program Officer for the Paul Ramsey Foundation. Thank you, Abigail, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's lovely to be with you today. And we at the Paul Ramsey Foundation are thrilled to be supporting this work by the Melbourne Institute. Our mission at the foundation is to help break the cycle of disadvantage in Australia. And to do that, we're committed to harnessing the power of the best analysis, the best data, the best collaboration to first understand and then try to disrupt the flows of disadvantage that constrain the lives of too many Australians. And the research from our friends at the Melbourne Institute is already influencing that work demonstrating and quantifying in new ways the transmission of disadvantage from one generation to the next, um, and the extent to which experiencing poverty as a child predicts 
future life outcomes. So like all of you, I'm really looking forward to today's presentation and the discussion to follow. So let me hand back over to the team at the Melbourne Institute. Great, thank you, Jenny. And now let me introduce the authors of the report. Please welcome Professor Roger Wilkins and Dr. Esperanza Vera Toscano. For today's colloquium, Esperanza will be presenting the findings from their study, and then both Roger and Esperanza will be involved in the discussion that follows. Roger Wilkins is the Deputy Director of the Melbourne Institute, as well as the Deputy Director of Research of the HILDA survey. His research interests include the nature, causes, and consequences of labor market outcomes, the distribution and dynamics of individual ec economic well being, and the incidence and determinants of poverty, social exclusion, and welfare dependence. Roger is a member of the Australian Bureau of Statistics Labor Statistics Advisory Group the Australian Housing and Urban Research Research Panel, and the Department of Social Services Building a New Life in Australia Survey Technical Reference Group. He is also a policy advisor for the Australian Council of Social Research and research fellow at the IZA Institute of Labor Economics. Esperanza Vera Toscano joined the Melbourne Institute as a senior research fellow in 2019 after having served as a senior researcher at the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. Esperanza has a long-standing expertise in the study of disadvantage, social exclusion, and individuals' well-being. She has more than two decades of experience that has included working for government agencies such as the National uh, Research Council for Spain and Statistics Canada. She also has extensive collaboration on projects undertaken by the World Bank and the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. Esperanza will speak for approximately 20 minutes. This will then be followed by a couple questions. And then we have asked Mr. Peter Harris to provide commentary on this report. As many of you likely know Peter, I will keep his bio short. Peter has served in numerous positions in government and as a policy advisor, which includes being a former chair of the Productivity Commission. Currently, he is a board member on Infrastructure Australia and is working on projects for CETA and serves on the Melbourne Institute's advisory board. Let me remind you of a few housekeeping matters for this colloquium. It is being recorded. To handle questions and comments, we are relying on the Q&A function found at the bottom of your screen for those of you using Zoom. For those of you using Slido, you can submit questions in the box on the right-hand side of your screen please submit questions at any time. And now please join me in welcoming Esperanza. Okay, thank you Abigail. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining us today on this uh, SHARE initiative with the Paul Ramsey Foundation and the Melbourne Institute to learn more about uh, poverty in Australia. Uh, the research we are presenting today is uh, co-author with uh, Professor Roger Wilkins, and uh, it is about the intergenerational transmission of, of poverty, meaning the extent to which growing up in a poor household is likely to affect the poverty experience later on as uh, you grow uh, as young adult. And to motivate a research uh, like this one, I wanted to highlight two important facts. The first one being that poverty and socioeconomic disadvantage continue to be important public policy issues for Australia. Using internationally recognized measures of poverty, uh, statistics tell us that about 14% of Australian population was living in poverty in the year 2018. And this is a percentage which is higher than in the same one in other developed countries, including New Zealand, uh, Germany, or Ireland, according to OECD statistics. This means that over 3 million Australians are poor, and out of which 800,000 are children below 15 years of age. Moreover, the Productivity Commission argues that this percentage has remained steady and constant throughout 30 years, despite the economic growth and prosperity witnessed by a country like Australia. The Australian government has acknowledged the importance of this issue and in 2015 joined other countries adopting the Sustainable Development Goals, one of which aims to decrease in poverty by half in the year 2030. But there is also another motivation for a study like this that can be found in the policymaking front. 
Because while it is true that government can put in place remedial policies to combat poverty, such as, for example, housing, uh, social housing or income support benefits, a deeper understanding of the origins and mechanisms underlying poverty can improve the basis for making and implementing preventive policies which can improve the well-being of families and their individuals as well as the community as a whole. And one important potential channel in this regard is the poverty experience in childhood. And of course, we can intuitively think that if you grew up in a poor household, you are very likely to experience poverty later on in life. However, for the case of Australia, there is little evidence on this matter. There is little evidence on the extent to which poverty can be transferred as you grow up and the nature of that, of that transmission. This is the reason why we started asking questions about the extent to which being poor as a child in Australia equals to being poor as an adult, or what type of socioeconomic outcomes should we expect from children or from young adults which grew up in poor household as children compared to their poverty-free counterparts? Or is really there a transmission of intergenerational poverty how much of that it, it exists in Australia? I mean, there was a bunch of questions, some of which we've tried to reply on this report and some of which have been left in the pipeline for forthcoming research, hopefully. But how have we tackled this fascinating challenge of understanding better uh, this uh, uh, issue? We have done some using, we have done some, uh, done so using a very unique data set, the Household Income and Labor Dynamics in Australia survey. This survey, as you may well know, uh, is a national representative longitudinal uh, study of Australian household that follows over 17,000 Australians each year. Individuals and their families are interviewed every year, allowing us to see how their lives change and evolve across time. And this has been going on since the year 2001, and nowadays we can rely on 18 waves of data of this HILDA survey, soon to be 19 years of uh, data. Interestingly, this survey is quite unique because it collects information related to household and family uh, relationships, as well as information about the education of the family members, the employment situation in terms of type of employment, um, uh, earnings that they make, how much money comes into the household, but also information about self-reported health status and, and other objective measures of health, as well as even life satisfaction. And this is important because these are a bunch of, of uh, uh, variables which are widely used in the literature of disadvantage, poverty, and social exclusion. Last, uh, the survey follows not only the initial sample, but uh, uh, subsequent children and descendants are also followed. And this is important because it makes this a very lively survey, which allows us to uh, build a robust and solid picture or movie about how the generation evolves across time. And how have we uh, really used this sample to reply our research questions in this report? Well, uh, first of all, we have followed individuals across time, meaning that we took children that were aged 9 to 15 years of age in the year 2001, and we have observed them as they grow up to 2018 when they become 26 to 32 years of age. This is what we define as early adulthood, which is the time by which hopefully many of the children will be out of the parental home and will have become financially uh, independent. Also, we are able through uh, using this unique data set to identify uh, poor individuals. And we do so throughout the report using a poverty measure, which is based on income poverty. Using reliable information on household income, we are able to draw the poverty line, a standard one using uh, internationally, and uh, identify those individuals that fall below the poverty line and above the poverty line. But not only in the report, as you will see, not only we have relied on poverty based on income poverty, but also since the year 2002, information on wealth has been collected every four years. And wealth is also an indicator of inequality because depending on the wealth of the parents, these parents can invest more or less on their children in their future and in their future. So we, you will see, and I will briefly show you, how we have not only relied on income poverty, but also on wealth to uh, associate poverty in childhood to poverty in adulthood. Last, 
uh, given the longitudinal nature of Hilda, we, we are able within the poor people that we have identified to distinguish those which are occasionally poor or temporarily poor from the, those which are persistently poor, meaning that they've been observed in poverty for more than 50% of the time they've been present in the survey. And this has allowed us to categorize individuals as those which are poverty free, that throughout the time they've been observing the survey, they were never under poverty, those which will experience low poverty, medium poverty and high poverty. With the later one, as I said, being those which have been in poverty for more than 50% of the time. So let me jump quickly into some interesting results. And we begin by, by focusing, as I said, on our nine to 15 years old children. We categorize them as never poor, occasionally poor, regularly poor, and frequently poor, depending on the length of time they've been poor as children. And then we go and find out how many of those are still poor or declared to be poor when they are 18, 19, 20, and so on and so forth until they reach the age of 32. This will allow us to uh, see how they perform as they age in terms of poverty. Results here show, for example, that 5% of the individuals that were in the never poor uh, subcategory declared to be poor when they were 18 years old. And this percentage remains for the sample of, or subsample of never poor remain more or less stable and low around five to 7% of um, the population being exposed to an episode of poverty. However, the picture, as you can see, is very different from the frequently poor because we observe that those children that were found to be frequently poor, still 57% of them declared to be poor when they are 18 year old. And this percentage goes down to 49 when they are 19, 39 when they're 20, and so on and so forth, to reach 15% when they reach 26 to 30 years of age. The first conclusion we can re uh, get to is that there is some greater intergenerational transmission of disadvantage among the poor people than the never poor uh, uh, people as uh, children. But uh, as children become more economically independent, there is a great mobility out of poverty, particularly for the frequently poor children. However, still observe here that if you grew up in a frequently poor household, you are three times more likely to be poor than if you grew up in, another, in a poverty-free household. We have repeated this exercise not only for the poverty outcome, but other socioeconomic outcomes related to education, labor market out outcomes, uh, even health uh, and life satisfaction. And I'm not going to report them here, but just briefly summarize that our research confirmed that the poverty experience in childhood is associated with poorer socioeconomic outcomes in terms of educational attainment, labor market performance, health and overall life satisfaction. And just very briefly, I mentioned to you that we also use wealth, and you can see more of this in your report. But uh, just very briefly, you can see here that those children who grew up in a less wealthy household, in the poorer uh, ca uh, category of um, children uh, according to the wealth distribution, they are, the proportion of young adults found in poverty is around 30%. Whereas if they grew up in some of the top 20% wealthiest household, the probability or the proportion that are found to be poor goes down to half of it by 15%. So this already tells us uh, or allow, help us to answer part of one of the questions, which is that disadvantage in childhood is related to disadvantage in adulthood. But it doesn't tell us much about how long they are going to be poor for as they grow up as adults. To answer this question, we move on, we move on into the next step. And we uh, look at the children when they were, I mean, uh, when they were children, and we look at whether they were never poor, occasionally poor, regularly poor, or frequently poor, and we look at where they are once they get into adulthood, when they reach 18 years old and above. And we classify them following the same procedure into poverty free, occasionally poor, regularly poor, and frequently poor. And what do we observe? We observe that if we focus on those children which grew up poverty free, 63.4% are found to still be poverty free in adulthood. But there is a percent, uh, close to 30 something percent of them that are going to experience some poverty in their, in their early years of adulthood. 
with 23% being or falling into the occasionally poor category, 10% falling into the regularly poor, and 2.6% falling on the frequently poor category. If we repeat this exercise for the other group of children that grew up in occasionally poor, regularly poor, and frequently poor households, these are the figures that are come up. And here, let me stop to discuss three important results which I think are worth mentioning. The first one being that for those children which grew up in persistently poor households, we observe that only 12.2% remain persistently poor as adult, meaning that 88% escape persistent poverty. Oh, this, is this good news? I don't think so, because where do they go? We still find that 32.3% fall into the regularly poor category and 34.7% fall into the occasionally poor category. Only 21% will fully escape poverty in adulthood. The second important point then I want to make here is that if we focus in these three figures, which is where persistently poor children fall, which implies a poverty spell, you see that these figures are larger than the ones of their counterparts, which are better off meaning that the poverty experience of those which experience long poverty as children is going to be worse off. And the third point I want to highlight is very much related to this one, because if we focus on this 12.2% and we compare it with the same percentage for the regularly poor, occasionally poor, and never poor, we find that the children which grew up in a persistently poor household are 1.8 times more likely to be frequently poor than the regularly poor children. And we find this dividing these two figures. They are up to 2.1 times more likely to remain persistently poor than their occasionally poor uh, counterparts. And they are 4.7, close to five times more likely to fall into frequently poor than those poverty free individuals. So clearly the length of time you spend in this in disadvantage, the greatest, the, the, the risk that you are going to be spending long time in disadvantage as an adult. But you can claim that here I'm just simply relating poverty in childhood to poverty in adulthood. And I'm not taking into account that there might be other aspects, non-economic family characteristics, which may be related to the economic characteristics and mediating in this relationship. So the last step we made into this report is still at a very descriptive level to run a bunch of uh, regressions, uh, including family characteristics, as well as neighborhood characteristics and uh, labor market char characteristics. And we uh, um, consider up to three different outputs that were whether as an adult, your income was sufficient, meaning above the poverty line, whether you were ever poor and whether you were persistently poor. Here I'm going to report only the ever poor, but the, the picture is very si similar across the three outcomes, which um, reassure our results to a great extent. And let me just uh, briefly discuss for a few minutes about the different specifications we've been using here. First, we started uh, simply regressing uh, household income related variables with uh, during childhood with the probability that you were ever poor as an adult. And here, this variable, average household income to needs, which refers to whether your income as a child exceed the needs as a child, basically your, the income sufficiency as a child, whether this had an impact in poverty later on. Of course, the greater the sufficiency, the less likely you are to be poor as expected. As we can see here, the result is negative and significant. However, we have not yet considered this multivariate environment. When we include family characteristics, we observe that the coefficient decrease, but it still remains significant, meaning that definitely there are aspects of family life which are mediating, but still there seems to be an economic component into this uh, transmission of poverty from childhood into adulthood. We have also used other measures like playing average household income as other studies, uh, similar studies done for the US, for example. And we find that in fact, income um, has an impact on the probability of ever being poor, but we don't find any significant result, for example, for the average number of children, which in, in America we found had a, a negative impact. I mean, it increased the probability of, of being poor. 
Uh, last, uh, uh, also, we thought, okay, uh, these uh, um, specifications here uh, assume a, a linear relationship in the distribution of income, but it, it may be that the experience of poverty is crudest among those which are most at need. So what we did is we divided this, uh, this distribution of, of income to needs ratio in, in, of, of, of income to needs into different ratios to study the non-linearity of, uh, of this variable. And we observed, suspected that if, you, uh, if your income to needs is below one, meaning that you are low income, the probability of being poor is significantly higher than the reference category and much higher than if you are close to low income. Interestingly, we do not observe, for example, that, that if you are very, very, very rich, you are much less likely to be poor. But the important point is that we find that those most at need are more likely to be ever poor. And last, we also account for the length of time you've been poor as a child. And there, again, it confirms our hypothesis that the longer that you are, you've been poor, always taking into account these non-economic family characteristic, uh, neighborhood characteristics and um, labor market characteristics, uh, still we find that there is a, a relationship between the length of time spent in poverty and the probability of being poor as an adult. Here, very briefly, the results are the same for frequently poor and, as I said, also for income sufficiency as an adult. So to sum up, what are the major messages, messages this report is trying to give? Four of them. The first one, low income during high childhood is a key predictor of disadvantage later in life. As I said, children from poor household are over three times more likely to, suf to suffer adult poverty than if they grew up in a poverty uh, free household. Second, the longer the period they, sp the period they spend in poverty, the poorer the outcomes in childhood. And this, uh, I want you to remember that 12.2 figures of being persistently poor when you grew up in a persistently poor household. Those children are up to 4.7 times more likely to experience that persistent poverty than their uh, poverty-free counterparts. Also, we found that the experience of poverty is associated with poorer socioeconomic outcomes related to educational attainment, labor market, performance, health, and even overall life satisfaction. And again, and last, when we test these uh, uh, controlling for other uh, characteristics, uh, our uh, hypothesis, uh, I mean, our results support the economic resource model, meaning that poverty begets poverty. So, what are the further considerations of our work? Well, given the magnitude of the estimated associations we find, and the fact that the stronger relationship if I, is identified among the poorest uh, families, it is sensible uh, for policy uh, to uh, make a case to combat childhood po uh, child poverty, because by uh, trying to uh, reduce child poverty, we will not only improve the well-being of these children as they grow, but also their families and even their community in, in the future. However, further research uh, is required to better understand the sources of that intergenerational uh, transmission of poverty and the different pathways for helping individuals build a better future. And this is where we are standing at right now and hope to have forthcoming research on this field too. Thank you very much, and we remain at your disposal for any clarifications. Thanks. Great, thank you very much, Esperanza. Uh, and now we're gonna be joined by Roger as well as Esperanza. I'm gonna ask you um, uh, two questions, um, and then we will move uh, to our discussant, Peter Harris. Um, so the first question is a very technical question. Um, and the, it's why are you using a relative poverty measure, uh, meaning 50% of median income, over an absolute measure? Yeah, I'll, I'll have a go at that, Esperanza. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, an absolute measure uh, is, is typically sort of uh, uh, based around the, a minimum income needed or, or resources needed to support, I guess, you know, feed and shelter yourself. And... Uh, whereas a, a relative poverty measure is like the one we've used more about uh, uh, maintaining a certain level of st standard of living relative to a measure of average living standards in the community. Both measures have information content. Uh, the relative poverty measure is more commonly used in, in developed countries and an, an absolute measure is more commonly used in developing countries. Uh, 
the, 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 the reasoning underpinning a relative measure is that what we are talking about for the most part, the way we interpret poverty is as a measure of your ability to participate in what could be considered the normal activities of, of life in that society. So, uh, um, so uh, it, it's, uh, it, it, and so there's a, it, it is still a rather arbitrary, you know, 50% of the median, is it 60%, is it 40%? Uh, you, you sort of have to draw a line somewhere, um, but there, but it, it's, uh, it, it, it does seem to have uh, uh, stood the test of time a bit that 50% uh, seems to accord with uh, general sort of community perceptions of what a, an acceptable minimum living standard uh, is, uh, and so uh, um, and, and so I think that's probably why it it um, it, it it persists uh, as a as a concept. Um, but uh, the, and I guess the other thing is when you're comparing, you know, at the turn of you know a hundred years ago, things like um, running water and sewage and so on weren't the norm, but now they are, and we would expect that you would have access to those things to have a, de a decent standard of living. So it's about, that, that's, the, that's the rationale for that sort of measure. So. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I was gonna ask a second question, but I, um, I see a third question has come in that are, that's related, and I think it will benefit from including Peter in the answer to this question. So Peter, if you're okay, I'm gonna turn it over to you for your commentary, and then we will come back for more questions. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Abigail. And uh, first I'd like to say Esperanza and Roger, it's a, it's a really good piece of work and I was uh, quite impressed with it and you're gonna help to take this debate a bit further. Um, as most people will know who've been interested in this matter, the Productivity Commission late in my time uh, did some own motion research on inequality. And at the end of it, uh, at the end of that uh, commentary on inequality, we found um, that notwithstanding uh, income improvements over the last 30 years at all income levels in Australia, there had been this area of persistent disadvantage. The 2 million or so people that Esperanza referred to, including you know, 700, 750,000 children who were consistently through that period uh, at, ve at very low income levels and potentially at risk of not being able to move out of those very low income levels. So this is, this is a fine piece of research and a very good use of uh, the HILDA database to take this debate a bit further forward. Um, I would like to note though that notwithstanding the fact that you have Hilda for this purpose, one of the areas the Productivity Commission and, and me personally since uh, I've left this job of uh, like to point out to governments and to uh, researchers uh, is we have a very poor investment level in these kinds of, of data sets. And I know the Commonwealth is again from a Productivity Commission report now moving ahead with the idea of creating through the National Data Commission, a, a, a set of interlinked data sets, potentially what we call national interest data sets. And this is a classic area, it seems to me, for both further analysis, not just of who is it and how many are there and what are the potential causes, but also as a potential development mechanism for a response. And at CEDA, uh, we've been trying to do a little bit of work on this policy, possible policy responses that might take advantage of, of data sets and generate uh, uh, the kinds of activities by governments working collectively together, that is across both state and Commonwealth, to address this area of persistent disadvantage. And one of the areas obviously is to put a uh, good focus on if we can do that, is the disadvantage that children suffer and the consequences Esperanza and Rogers paper has pointed out of seeing inherited disadvantage move across generations. So I think the fact that we have ever better numbers as these numbers show and the fact that we can put together decent data sets if only we will get greater cooperation between Commonwealth and state across the kinds of information through uh, the income tax data sets for example and through the Medicare based data sets uh, as an additional item and then through some of the social welfare measures uh, particularly in in the early period of childhood that would enable us to help people uh, by what I call, we find you, not you find us. In other words, we take advantage of early data set information and we offer people assistance in moving into the part of the system that can respond to uh, persistent disadvantage. So I think uh, it's an excellent piece of work and I hope it uh, pushes this agenda along a bit. Good job. Great. Thank you, Peter. And um, for the uh, plug around the importance of data, that is part of the work we are doing in collaboration with the 
uh, Paul Ramsey is around building uh, stronger and deeper shared data environments to study disadvantage. So thank you. Um, so uh, let me uh, move to a set of questions um, that are gonna be a little bit more broad and then I may get to some more um, particular questions that are showing up. Um, so the first thing is uh, the question really is when we think about that transition from 18 to 26 years old, um, Esperanza. So you showed some graphs where it starts out high in terms of the poverty, but then it falls. And so that's leading to two types of questions. One is, is there something um, about this, um, this period of young adults around plasticity of their, their brains and their activities that could be leading to this decline and, and disadvantage? And then the second component is what's the role of educational attainment uh, during that period? So I open it up to all of you uh, for responding to plasticity and educational attainment. Oops, sorry. Uh, let me just share with you the, 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 this again to focus on that uh, particular slide, which I think is this one here. Uh, and maybe Roger can also help <laughs> answer the question. I mean, this is simply a, a descriptive statistics where we are linking the, the, the we are finding out the, the proportion of people which are in poverty when they are 18 years old. Uh, if they grew up in a persistently poor household. And as, you, as I discussed, uh, uh, we see a, a decrease. Clearly, I think that this may be lead, lead, uh, linked to the fact that they are gaining greater educational attainment and therefore they're improving their skill to enter into the labor market. Uh, as uh, you can find out in the report, uh, we also tested for the percentage of individuals which were uh, which uh, reach uh, a, a university degree when they were 18, 19, 20, 21, by uh, whether they were in persistent uh, uh, in a frequently poor household as children compared to uh, those in a poverty-free environment. And the results are exactly the opposite. The, the, uh, if you are in a poverty-free household, the la you are more likely to reach a, a university. You are 1.4 times more likely to reach a university degree than if you grew up in a frequently uh, poor household. So I think that I mean, I don't know if I'm answering this question or Roger has something else to say, but clearly there is a relationship between these numbers and the fact that the individuals are different in their cognitive skills and their uh, readiness for being in the labor market. And this has been shown in the, in the socioeconomic outcomes that we have found in, in our descriptive analysis, right? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, I think there's definitely some, you know, uh, uh, you know, escaping poverty going on for those who grew up in in poverty as, as children, you know, and, uh, you know, partly that's, you know, and that's related to them getting a foothold in the labour market. And, uh, um, but, you know, they tend to, you know, we also find that they tend, they, yeah, they have lower education, but they, they also are more likely to move out of the parental home earlier. They're, they're more likely to have ch children at younger ages, which for a given level of income lowers your, uh, your your equivalized income, you know, the, the income sort of per per adult equivalent, um, and and so those sorts of things start to uh, there is this is showing some evidence that uh, of of some convergence, and ideally, I think you know as Hilda gets goes on, we'll be able to look further and further into their adult lives and see just how truly long term persistent uh, you know damage, if you like, is is being done by the early childhood experience. I think. You know, with, with the, the longer term sort of outcomes is much better sort of, I think, captured by the last data point on the figure that uh, Esperanza um, has, has put up. Um, yeah, yeah, because as you can see there, uh, in the end, even when they are when they are already 26 or 32 years old, those which grew up in a frequently poor household are three times more likely to still have some poverty spells in their life. So, I mean, it's true that they're improving into the readiness to get into society, but of course, there is still something in them which seems to be related to their poverty experience in childhood. But as I said, it's very descriptive and maybe we need to... Um, Peter, do you have uh, comments on this? And, and, and in particular, I'm, I'm kind of interested, I know this is going a little bit beyond the study, but the, the, you know, when we think about the importance of education, you know, is it, you know... Yeah. Is, I, is it that education is failing us or is it that the students aren't pursuing the education? 
Um, well, I will try and answer this in, in commentary too, to uh, one or two of the other questions that have popped up here. Um, there's a question, for example, about whether you can address uh, uh, child poverty without addressing poverty in general. And education is a really good example of why you can address child poverty. I'm not saying you should ignore poverty in general. I'm simply saying there are mechanisms by which you can directly ad address child poverty. Education is a good example, but there are other social welfare support mechanisms which people are failing to get access to because the system is so complex, which is why this question of identifying uh, children at risk very early on in, you know, in their first thousand days, as it were, and offering them a navigator, a direct assistance to that family in terms of being able to get uh, support, and particularly it's in support in access to education. Um, and that, that also includes remaining in education. And so we are talking here additional measures, but some states do actually already invest in this and some don't. And the question is one of a national uh, facility, I think, uh, in support of this kind of idea of offering those services to those families with the assistance of, a, of an entity to help them navigate within uh, that area. Now, that kind of design work is, um, I know there's a number of parties working on that and I uh, mentioned Cedar earlier, it's one of the sorts of things we're thinking about dealing with. But yeah, access to education is, is a particular mechanism by which you can try and help uh, slow, if not remove uh, the transference of poverty between generations. Okay. Um, it, a technical question is when you look at that age range around 20, um, it, uh, as Burns and Roger, can you uh, tell us how much of the low income that's reported at that age range might be due to the fact that these are individuals attending uh, college or university or, or, or getting further education? So they just have a reported low income because they're not working full time. Well, we haven't directly looked at that, but um, and you know, obviously that will be part of the story. But what's um, what we do know though is that uh, uh, those who were less poor as children are more likely to be going to university, um, and uh, uh, and they still have low poverty rates at those ages. So there's some, uh, it, some so maybe there's some sort of interaction going on where the the, the, the kids from poorer families are more likely to be living on their own or, you know, with, uh, you know, away from the parental home if they're going to university. And that's, but that's not something that we have, I don't think Esperanza looked at, have we? No, we haven't uh, dropped these individuals or having a look into those things. So, so on the education point, because I'm getting a few questions and comments. So, um, uh, so Penny Dorsch from ACOS is, is asking, uh, surely the education issue is in part about access to education given uh, tertiary education costs money. Uh, and then uh, another comment uh, that, you know, a, you know, a strong predictor of access to post-secondary education is the education of the parents. Um, so taking those into account. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I guess I agree with both those uh, statements rather than <laughs> uh, questions. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that's um, um, that, that's certainly um, um, what's yeah, you know, that's an important mechanism. And I mean, we do we uh, we do control for the effects of parental education, um, and we still find an independent effect of uh, of parental income or parental poverty. Um, uh, so it's not just about parents' parents' education uh, in, in in driving the this intergenerational uh, transmission. Um, uh, and in terms of access to education, I guess the real cost of education that, that's a barrier to kids from poorer families is the need to support yourself uh, while you're in education because uh, we can defer the, the fees. Um, and you know, perhaps there's an issue about the adequacy of youth allowance, or it's, um, uh, or it's about you know, uh, and whether it's um, sufficiently available uh, to, to kids from poorer families living with their parents. Okay, and um, I think we're going to uh, wrap up with one uh, final question. It's a big question, though. Uh, the uh, is the fundamental problem with addressing. Uh, childhood poverty, um, the lack of income, which could be solved by 
more income support, um, or the factors that lead to parental poverty. So this also gets to questions around, you know, how can we talk about child poverty if we're not talking about poverty in, in general? Well, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, so, I mean, we are, we, we are finding that what seems to matter is the poverty of the parents rather than their joblessness per se, or, um, but, you know, is the way to solve the parental poverty to give them more income or to uh, get them into jobs or, um, yeah, we, this, this research doesn't have anything to say on that front, um, uh, on, on, you know, on what the way to, the best way to, uh, but uh, certainly, um, directly giving people money um, does solve the problem. So, yeah, maybe it's not yeah, in terms of removing, re, yeah, it, removing the poverty that the children are living in. Does it solve the parents' pro longer term problems? Not, yeah, you know, maybe not. You know, and and uh, and and uh, um, and and maybe that would be a reason for looking at those sorts of drivers of the parental poverty. But I think what our evidence is showing is that simply just getting the kids out of poverty um is likely to um improve their long-term economic outcomes no matter how you do that yeah my point here is that we have we are dealing with two different issues one is the poverty in general and and this study in particular has focused on the extent to which growing up as the poor child has impact later on in adulthood so of course the, both uh, uh, issues need to be tackled so of course you need to put in place remedial policies to combat poverty overall. But this study tries to prove that if we pay a greater attention to those families with children in a school age and so on, maybe uh, we are, I mean, quite likely, we're going to improve the well-being of those families, um, of those children and of those children when they grow up. So of course we cannot abandon the overall idea of combating poverty, full stop. But uh, this, just because of the specific purpose of this study is why we, we say that children deserve further attention, especially if they grow up in a poor household. Okay, and Peter, do you have any last comments on this uh, uh, question? Yeah, I think in a sense, the question sets up an unfair dichotomy. Is it income or is it something else? Um, it's clearly a lot of things. And the point is, if you're going to design policy for to address these things, you'll have to address more than one. Um, simply increasing the income of someone who is in poverty may address some issues, but if, if the core, root cause of it is uh, remote Australia location, or if the root cause of it is alcoholism, or if the root cause, in other words, of the disadvantage, the initial disadvantage and the, the persisting one that might prevent a child from remaining in education, for example, then you have to design the policy solution to the nature of the problem, which is why I come back to this question of the fact that we do actually have the data. It's just separated between Commonwealth and state. It's not linked and it's not used to design pieces of public policy that might then address individual families that are in this situation. And we know, I think someone was earlier interested in the numbers and saying, well, what have we captured? Have we captured here uh, people on student incomes when we talk about the 2 million who are disadvantaged? Or, uh, and then there's no doubt the PC report actually says this, the 2 million who are in that very low income level. Some are students, some are small business owners who are not, not taking any income at all. And they get captured in that income statistic. And some are, are people on part pensions. So there are plenty of people in the 2 million, but sieve the numbers down, there's a persistent 700 to 800,000 over a 30 year period that really haven't moved very much. And it's a question of whether we're able to use, in my view, a data sources to better able to target them. Um, again, um, the importance of shared data environments and bringing data together so that we can study this important issue. Uh, so unfortunately we are out of time. Uh, let me thank our speakers and let me thank Peter Harris for commenting and thank you the audience. I hope you have enjoyed this colloquium. In the chat function, we have posted a link to the first Breaking Down Barriers report. Um, there will be several others. And in fact, our next colloquium is going to feature the second report in the series, which will cover the spatial and community dimensions of poverty. And it's going to be held on Tuesday, November 10th. You can register for future colloquia by following the link that has just been posted in the chat function and posted next to uh, the live stream on Slido. 
Thank you, everybody, and I look forward to seeing you next time.